Okay, good morning. The numbers seem to have stabilised. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the first session of this year's School of Security Studies Research Conference on the theme of Back to the Future, Continuity and Change in the Study of War and Conflict. And our first panel is organised by the Military and Political History Research theme on the subject of trends in the historiography, land, maritime and air warfare. Uh, we have three speakers who I'll introduce individually as they give their papers and there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Uh, if you have a question please use the Zoom Q&A function uh, and I should let you know that the session is being recorded and live streamed uh, if you uh, do not wish to be included uh, in the uh, recording. Thank you. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Gary Sheffield uh, who's a visiting professor in our Defence Studies Department at King's uh, and has formerly been Land Warfare Historian of the Higher Command and Staff course at the Joint Services and Command and Staff College. He's currently writing uh, a book, Civilian Armies, The Experience of British and Dominion Soldiers in the Two World Wars, to be published by Yale University Press, and he's an expert uh, more generally on the British Army in the era of the Two World Wars. And he will begin the conference by telling us about trends in land historiography from the Napoleonic to the 20th century. Thank you, Gary. OK, well, thanks very much, uh, Bill. And it's really good to be back at DSD after 19 years, albeit broadcasting from my spare bedroom. Well, when the instructions uh, came, came down to cover the historiography of land warfare, it has changed off the last three or four decades. Um, I was really horrified to think that that's basically the span of my academic career. And so that's actually the chance to uh, reflect on some changes in one of my key areas of research. It, it's truly an enormous subject, and so I can only zoom in on some key issues. Undoubtedly, I would have missed some key books and key articles. I'm very grateful for any updates. Well, one thing I would say to start with is actually there's been remarkably little uh, scholarly work on some key aspects of land warfare. My only visual aid today is to plug this book by my DSD colleague, Chris Tuck, Understanding Land Warfare. I've just written the blurb for the uh, second edition. It, it is, it's an excellent overview, the, the best I've, I've read on the subject. Let's start by looking at morale and combat motivation. Uh, in land warfare, more often than not, armies have been defeated through failures of morale or motivation rather than being physically destroyed. The French army at Waterloo in 1815 is a classic example. Now, armies are composed obviously of individuals organized into units uh, and the morale of both is important. For, for many years, the ideas about this was dominated by, the, uh, by the, uh, the notion of the primary group or buddy group, which really goes back to Shields and Janowitz's classic article uh, in the late 1940s uh, about the Wehrmacht. But in recent years, there has been some challenges to this, or at least uh, making a more nuanced picture. About 15 years ago, Hugh Strawn published an article uh, arguing for the importance of training in combat motivation and morale. Essentially, his argument was that uh, does it matter whether you've bonded with the guy on your left and the guy on your right, providing you're both well trained, you know what to do, and actually you can rely on each other. And he pointed to various uh, units being composed of disparate individuals, but trained to a common pattern, who actually could be uh, militarily fairly effective. I think this is actually a, a, an obvious insight, but an important one. And one of the most stimulating books on the subjects I've read in recent years is Anthony King's Combat Soldier, which came out in 2013. He's a sociologist rather than, than a historian. Uh, but what he's done is at least partially uh, rehabilitate the work of SLA Marshall, the uh, US combat historian who famously, maybe infamously claimed that only one in four riflemen in, uh, in, in US units in the Second World War actually fired their weapons. And that, uh, Marshall has actually been, been attacked, but I think he's gone some way to rehabilitating um, his ideas. And he's come up with the idea of the Marshall effect, the idea that uh, citizen armies, essentially volunteer um, or, or conscript armies, are passive unless something is done to shake them out of their passivity. The things like appeals to their masculinity, inculcating bloodlust, things like bayonet charges, and, uh, and direct and heroic, and in some cases, pretty well suicidal, leadership. I've written a piece on the British Army at Gallipoli, which actually tended to support this. Actually, it actually works quite well as a model. 
but I'm far from certain that it would work as well for more experienced armies later in the First World War or for that matter in the Second World War. But I think actually King's uh, work is important and worth engaging with. And the final thing I'll mention under this uh, heading is the work of a, of a DSD co colleague, Jonathan Fennell, whose uh, book Fighting the People's War, which came out in 2019, argues that in British Empire armies of the Second World War, there was a, a lack of understanding about why they were fighting. There was a disconnect between the people's war rhetoric and soldiers in the field. There was no great ideological zeal. There was a deficit of political legitimacy, uh, as, uh, as he puts it. Basically, soldiers didn't know why they were there, just fighting in order to go home. They had lacked faith in their leaders to deliver on a new Jerusalem. Uh, very important book. And I think that his uh, ideas are well worth exploring in other contexts. So we've actually seen the whole idea of morale and combat motivation some of the key factors in land warfare. Um, challenged, transformed, certainly made more nuanced over the last few years. Moving on to tactics, I'm going to look at the First World War, and we have gone from the idea, going back to the likes of Alan Clark in the early 60s, that there was just blind bashing, towards um, the understanding that in, in armies, uh, particularly on the Western Front, there was uh, a learning process, or rather a series of learning, learning processes, and some sophisticated methods emerged by the end. Uh, I've contributed to this, and as so have many other people, and I would mention another DSD colleague, um, Amy Fox, done some very important work on learning in the British Army. But it's not just the British, um, as um, other people, including our chairman, has, show, has shown. It's also true for the French Army. And Michel Goya's book, uh, fairly recently translated into English, is very good on this. And while back in the 80s and 90s, there was, I think, it's a rather uncritical view of the military excellence of the German Army in the Second uh, First World War, that has changed. And so uh, going forward from people like Timothy Lupfer and uh, Bruce Goodmanson through to inevitably another DSD colleague, Robert T. Foley, uh, today, there is an understanding that the German army got a lot right. They also got a lot wrong. And but so in general, the tactical picture for the First World War is a lot more interesting and more nuanced than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And also, just, just as an aside, I think we've seen a similar translate, uh, um, a similar um, change in the way that historians look at the tactics of the British Army in the Second World War. For many years, this subject was dominated by popular historians and journalists, people like Max Hastings and Carlo Deste, who were pretty damning of British uh, tactical methods in comparison with supposed excellence of the Germans in the Second World War. But in recent years, that's been turned around. So uh, Neil Barr of DSD, looking at the desert campaign, and my former Wolverhampton colleague, John, uh, John Buckley, done an awful lot to, I think, rehabilitate British tactical practice in the Second World War. So linking that back to Jonathan Fennell's work, we've got a really interesting new perspective on British Army in the Second World War emerging. Well, going up to the operational level and operational art, uh, I think that historians now generally recognise that uh, this was understood before Zveshin came up with, with the term operational level in, in, in the 1920s. In other words, people knew about this stuff before the mid 20th century, but they didn't have the vocabulary or necessarily the same vocabulary to express these ideas that we have today. Operational art, which is in big handfuls, is, is coping with a massively expanded battlefield uh, dealing with entire theatres, indeed multiple theatres, uh, Klaus Telp has traced this back to the German, uh, sorry, the Prussian army of Frederick the Great in the 18th century. Robert M. Epstein has looked at Napoleon's 1809 campaign against the Austrians. Uh, DSD's Hugh Davis has looked at Wellington in the peninsula. Uh, various people have looked at Moltke the Elder uh, campaigns, particularly against France in 1870. And Brian Holden Reed of King's are uh, on the American Civil War. All of this suggests that people actually are uh, commanders, at least good commanders, understood these concepts. And so we need to push back the idea of the operation, operational level of war and operational art uh, back into the 19th, even into the 18th century. And for what it's worth, my argument is that Haig actually had a good understanding of this, although he was not always able to put it into practice with effect during the First World War. <laughs> 
Now, linked to this is what I've used as a subheading: the uh, the rise and fall. Uh, sorry, the yeah, yeah, the, uh, the the rise and fall of Blitzkrieg. Writing in 1990 about the um, Soviet offensives into Germany in 1945, Christopher Duffy uh, said it's unfortunate no one has come up with a better term than Blitzkrieg to apply to our style of war, which is familiar to every student of 20th century military history. Um, I think he's right about that, that we all know what Blitzkrieg is, uh, 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 offensive fighting, combined arms, air power plays a key role, uh, punching through, exploiting, disrupting the enemy as much as, much as destroying them. Um, now, Blitzkrieg, if you read sort of the popular literature of, say, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, it's a German speciality. It's the way the Germans deliberately conducted their war and the Allies at the beginning of the Second World War weren't able to cope with it. Well, the arguments put forward by J.P. Harris and others in the 1980s and 90s was that actually the Germans did not go into the campaign in France in 1940 with uh, a Blitzkrieg doctrine as such. Rather, but as various historians, and here uh, Karl Heinz Frieser's The Blitzkrieg Legend, published in 1996, appeared uh, in English in 2005, have shown Blitzkrieg thinking was the consequence, not the cause, of German success in 1940 against France. In effect, the Germans carried out a highly risky series of manoeuvres, which worked for a whole series of reasons, and thereafter it was adopted as a sort of doctrine. And um, it, it links back to the German obsession with uh, operational art trying to reproduce Cannae, uh, which was occurred in 1870, failed to occur in 1914, and the Second World War version is basically motorizing it. In other words, adding uh, modern transport methods to uh, an old, 100 year old plus uh, military concept, which of course dates back to the Roman period. Well, it nearly worked in 1941 against the Soviet Union. Um, but as uh, Martin Van Krevelt reminded us in Supplying War, as far back as 1977, the Germans set themselves uh, a near impossible task in logistic terms, given the, uh, the ambition of their attack into the Soviet Union. But as John Erickson in the 80s and more recent scholars such as David Glantz and David uh, Stahl have shown, the failure of Operation Barbarossa was due to a combination of German weaknesses at every level, from the strategic to the tactical, but also the resistance of the Red Army and, uh, and, and Soviet decision making. So the old idea of brilliant Germans and useless Soviet stooges, the Germans being defeated by Hitler's stupid decisions and by the weather, has been replaced by a much more nuanced version in which the Red Army has received agency. Where the Red Army's success in building on the pre-war ideas of deep battle uh, has also undergone uh, general recognition in the last 30 odd years. We've gone a long way from John Ellis's book, Brute Force, which appeared in 1990. Actually, it was already outdated uh, when it appeared, uh, to the recognition of the scientific approach applied by the Soviet forces in the Second World War. Uh, writers such as Charles Dick and David Glantz, uh, actually, uh, uh, especially important. But it's, it's really, really, really important to note that actually this is not simply Blitzkrieg in the German sense. It has some commonalities with Blitzkrieg, but actually, uh, Soviet style has a good deal of uh, attrition, in it, which is why many people don't actually like using the, the term Blitzkrieg in reference to, to, to Soviet deep battle. Well, German Blitzkrieg came unstuck in 1942, essentially as enemies learnt the, uh, the counters to Blitzkrieg and the German ran, ran, out, ran out of luck and the remorseless attrition of fighting against superior enemies started to kick in. And for me, Richard Overy's uh, 1995 book, why, why the Allies Won, is still, I think, a very good text explaining why. Well, the final subject I want to look at is the triumph of attrition. Now, attrition has gone from virtually being a dirty word associated with the nadir of generalship, especially in the First World War, uh, hence uh, Yehuda Wallach's uh, 1987 book, the dogma of the Battle of Annihilation, uh, the, uh, the theories of Clausewitz and Schlieffen, 
and their impact on the German conduct of the two world wars. And also I think this is linked into uh, revulsion at the at, uh, American strategy in, in, in Vietnam. That has moved on to, to a recognition that attrition is a facet of all campaigns and battles and good commanders can use attrition to their advantage in a highly effective fashion. Now, this is, I think, very interesting when you look at the reputation of two American Civil War generals, uh, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant. Well, once upon a time, Lee was seen as the brilliant master of maneuver, um, but his reputation has taken a severe battering over the last few years. Alan T. Nolan's book, Lee the Marble Man, 1990, very good example of that, not the first and far from being the last example. Uh, there's a recognition that actually, by his relentless attacking, Lee, although he achieved a whole series of tactical and operational victories, not only failed to translate these into strategic victory, but actually wore out his own armies by, by attacking too much. Whereas, for example, uh, in Brooks D. Simpson's book on Grant's triumph over adversary, published in 2000, it's very clear that Grant understood attrition, understood the numbers game, and applied it highly effectively. Crew tactics on the battlefield may be, but overall, it was the right result for the Union. Our own chairman, uh, Bill Philpott, has also written very interestingly on Foch's use of attrition uh, in the First World War. And I think you ought to mention the late Elizabeth Greenhalge's work on, on, on Foch as well. Uh, and, and various other people have looked at this in a First World War context, including, including me, uh, arguing that uh, Haig had a mixture of attrition and breakthrough as part of his thinking, didn't always work. But in the end, I think actually it did, did deliver, deliver the goods. And Jonathan Boff um, at the University of Birmingham, but uh, did his PhD at King's under Bill, has argued very persuasively for the emergence of what he calls rolling attrition on the battlefield um, in 1917, 1918, conducting operations across a very wide front, grinding down the enemy in a series of relatively limited offensives, perhaps limited because the Allies did not possess uh, the technical ability to carry out deep, deeper operations at that stage. The Soviets in the Second World War certainly did. And so on the Eastern Front between 1943 and 1945, we see another version of rolling attrition, but sometimes, also given the amount of space available, the Soviets were able to advance perhaps as much as 200 miles. Uh, in a symbol of single operation, but it's, a, it's essentially rolling attrition. Someone else whose reputation has been, um, I think, refurbished to a degree over the last th uh, uh, few years because of his use of attrition is Berlin Montgomery. We've moved beyond the hagiography of Monty's own memoirs. Uh, I think the, the, the fairly uncritical biography of Nigel Hamilton and flipping it around, I think the very, the very hostile uh, work of Corelli Barnett uh, in the um, in, in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, to a much more, uh, I think, uh, sophisticated, nuanced look at what Montgomery was able to do. Uh, Neil Barr's writing on, on Alamein, I think, actually captured his use of attrition in the desert extremely well. And a, and a particularly impressive book, I think, is that by Stephen Hart, which came out in 2000, which uses a term uh, used by Montgomery himself, colossal cracks. The idea that Montgomery would uh, tee up a, a massive onslaught using attrition in a very, in, in a very focused fashion to break down the enemy, which actually was playing to the strengths of the British army in 1944-45. And finally, in this section, very briefly, a recent and still controversial book, Phillips O'Brien, How the War Was Won, come out in 2015. He argued that the Western allies, uh, rather than the Soviet Union, did most to defeat the Axis in the Second World War by using the air-sea super battlefield and destroying uh, the bulk of German and Japanese uh, war production. Land battles, by contrast, only actually used up uh, a relatively uh, um, small amount of cheap equipment like tanks and were fought in limited areas. There, actually, I think this book is genuinely a game changer in the way we think about the Second World War, but there are caveats. So Hugh Davy, for example, has argued that while well, land warfare might have occupied a smaller area, but these actually were more valuable areas in many ways than, 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 um, than empty stretches of water. 
many of the main features of winning the war, not least psychological, revolved around human beings and killing them and dominating them was most effectively done by soldiers on land rather than navies or air forces. For all that, it's a really important book and one which uh, someone, maybe even me, um, ought to apply the principles back to the First World War and to see how that helps us to reshape the way we think about that war. In conclusion, three very quick points. Uh, a lot has been written on land warfare over the last 30, 40 years, but there's plenty of scope for additional work. There are some surprising gaps in, in the literature and some of the older stuff is definitely in need of revisiting. Second point, just like uh, Phil O'Brien and Jonathan Fennell have integrated military with other sorts of history, not least social, political and economic, that is clearly the way forward. The old drum and trumpet approach of battles and generals and all the rest of it, uh, it's really nothing more than antiquarian now. It needs to be placed in, into a much broader context. And finally, it just seems that despite the digitized battlefield, the emergence of new technology and all the rest of it, classical military operations are still relevant. In 1991, 2003, and so it would seem in 2022. So the study of land warfare has a current utility, uh, ut ut utility. It isn't simply interesting for its own sake. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Very interesting and plenty of recommendations for uh, further reading, which I'm sure uh, our audience will appreciate. Uh, without further ado, I shall move on to our second speaker, uh, Dr. James Smith. He completed his doctorate in uh, the Department of War Studies at King's in 2021. He's now uh, heading up the Corbett 100 project in partnership with Professor Andrew Lambert and others in uh, the department. He's active in the King's uh, Wargaming Network uh, and uh, he's leading a research project currently looking at the relationship between maritime strategy and space. Uh, and I will uh, hand over to him to talk about uh, maritime dimensions of uh, historiography. Thank you, James. Thank you, Professor Philpott. It's been a great pleasure to present at King's 2022 School of Security Studies Research Conference. I must admit that I suspect ranks of historians would probably politely smirk at the title of our school conference, Back to the Future, because at the very core of military history, strategic studies and war studies, beyond purest historians who wish to write an account of a past event, many historians are equally futurists. Yet as hinted in school conference title, we find ourselves revisiting the past to think about contemporary problems, which for applied history, it's about looking at trends and analysis of a sustained period of time to think about these problems and challenges. It's a pertinent reminder that humanity rarely sits still, but also neither does the execution of warfare, tactics, and the rubble technology in it. It's a continually evolving, can easily be seen through the history of land, sea, air, and we can certainly add today, I think, cyber and space warfare, something historians have attempted, recorded, and debate through their scholarship. On land, if you track the trend from classical naval and land forces of Rome and Greece, the sword, armor advancements, the design of the longbow in England, the gun, the missile, the pressure for greater lethality is hardly new or how it shapes warfare, nor is it new how scholars have attempted to uh, record and discuss this. This can be easily equally seen in the maritime environment, whether that be on the sea surface, below or above it, in how it influences what happens on and over land. The age of sail that saw ships for trade, travel and warships reflected the growth of nations through global spanning exploration, empire, economic power, wars and conflict. And scholars have attempted to certainly explore that. To make way to then for navies for mechanization, industrial revolution in the 1800s, where sea power and maritime connections became embedded in national cultures, sometimes purposely, others by reality of being an island. Ultimately, this mechanization role resulted in the arrival of the dreadnoughts and battleships at the turn of the 20th century, and that placed emphasis on the big gun. The epoch of these ships in the World War I gave way to the submarine and the first steps in military aviation, something navies, in particular the Royal Navy for the Royal Navy Air Service, led the wave in. By the Second World War, again, at the epoch of Navy and the success of the world, around the world, having secured our logistics, ensured national survival, such as the Royal Navy's successful deterrence and invasion, the Battle of the Atlantic, and the zenith of American sea power so aptly demonstrated in the Pacific theater, saw naval warfare shaped again with air power, the missile, and nuclear age. Certainly, it seemed by 1945 that additional connections, myths, and sentiments that have been reflected in scholarship, but generally beyond that, that surrounded ship on ship action, a Nelsonian association that dated back to the 1500s with Sir Francis Drake and the Spanish Armada, was smashed apart. 
After 1945, the shape and scope of naval warfare changed again, but far more fundamentally. Thrown into the mix by extremist air power theorists, theorists, the concept that strategic air bombing could solve every foreign policy problem, while navies had completely annihilated any threat at sea, and the question of their mission and role started to become a key topic of debate by scholars, politicians and others in defence as the world moved to an age of nuclear brinkmanship, Cold War and limited conflict. Naval, naval warfare in itself, like land, are continually involved driven by technology. At times, naval advancements shaped the changing face of warfare on land, sea and air. That advancements in naval technologies and warfare could be driven by the state, and the fact that advancements in naval warfare could impact other forms of war warfare served to point out these complex organizations that developed for centuries operate in an environment inherently hostile that required professionalism, training, and the maintenance of in institutional coherence and memory, of which scholarship played its part as an educational tool and was central to the success. It also touches on the reality that the decision by nations to emphasize an unnatural environment for humans the sea, for exerting effort to develop strategic power to project influence beyond the limits of land, and it had placed navies central to national power, international relations, and the expansions of economic power through global trade over centuries. That this process had occurred in island nations and continental states alike proved that maritime power was far beyond naval warfare addressing seaborne threats, something scholars explored before 1939. But after all, naval warfare in battles at sea are quite rare and rarely decisive. But instead, the influence of sea forces upon land and the dependencies either for national survival, in the case of Britain, or the utilization and control of trade can be economic power to shape relations between na nations. The reality that since the professionalization of navies, naval warfare was rare, reflected reality that navies have become central to many nations' national defense policy up to 1945. It was less about naval warfare, and scholars also touched on this, but the range of other tasks sea power executed for the state non-military tasks like custodial, diplomatic to name a few, and the capability they brought to support foreign policy. It set them apart from soldiers and air forces who were landbound, but all of this was encumbered in the task in the state that reflects the times, priorities, and national realities that navies were being used for, and something that scholars attempted to address over the past century. However, that navies were central in culture, defense and policy changed after 1945, is critical in not only understanding the evolution of navies, but the ongoing process of developing maritime strategy, doctrine for sea power, and understanding naval warfare. This change is reflected in the historiography, even if understanding of how and why fundamental change had come around 1945 was left unaddressed, being one apparently of merely technological advancement and limited wartime analysis for navies in the Second World War. Dare I insert a plug for my own PhD thesis? The 1945 divide is essential to understand when it comes to not just research, existing scholarship, but also writing the history of navies for the broader spectrum of warfare and military history. Understanding strategy or so-called ways of warfare, national or otherwise, and the role of sea bay forces in and upon them has been shaped by the divide and reflecting the way we examine scholars' work, naval and maritime focus post-1945. The fact that the sea was equalized into a homogenous, homogenized way of thought and that it is classed as just another so-called domain, demonstrates how thinking about navies and the sea in strategic terms was displaced and replaced as just another form of military power. This was a particular outcome of a process that took place between 1945 and 1964 in Britain and abroad as part of defense unification that saw changes in the lexicon of warfare, policy, and strategy occur, and ideas based on land warfare, not sea warfare, were recasting thought on navies, their voice reduced, and scholarship equally so. The lexicon itself reflected technical and technicist views of warfare after 1945, as there was this reactionary turmoil that occurred because of the array of issues occurring in defense between nations and internal nations during those post-war decades. Talking technical about navies was to be the status quo for historians when we look at navies and a marked change to pre-1939. By placing regimented limits and rigid definitions on maritime strategy, discussion devolved to be one of naval power and naval solutions to naval problems. It brought in an era of land-focused continental ideas, Prussian, German, and American in origin, to debate over navies, and this was reflected in scholarship either by those in naval circles or those beyond it. This is the baseline to remember when viewing post-1945 historiography across the spectrum of naval-related scholarship and its interaction with topics beyond that, particularly in a Western view. This devaluation of thinking in maritime terms and switching to a simpler naval view was antithetical to the work of British historian, strategist, and philosopher of sea power and maritime strategy, Sir Julian Corbett. 
Corbett's work, who is a strategic thinker amongst the greats, had early in the 20th century, through objective engagement of the past, enabled him to develop theoretical models for modern maritime strategy and naval policy. At baseline, he was a historian. Corbett's goals were not just the education of naval officers to think more intellectually about doctrine, but also to increase understanding of national strategy amongst high-level policymakers. In contrast to other strategic theorists, such as Carl von Clausewitz, Corbett studied Britain's unique strategic problems as an island maritime power rather than that of continental state. Corbett's recognition that classical strategic theory, long dominated by continental military concerns, again reflected in the scholarship, conflicted with his analysis of Britain's national strategic experience over prior centuries that had resulted in the decision to emphasize the sea and develop a maritime strategy as national defense policy. Prior to 1945, Navy centrality to national def defense resulted in a cadre of civilian and military professionals to become naval intellectuals and scholars, all of whom who were historians and some advanced to questions about national strategic experience and theory. Naval historians were also engaged in popular writing of naval history, although it often fell prey of navalist or national propaganda in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Accessibility to naval history was certainly there over the past century. For navies, this was slightly more important than the other services, for it connected distant global maritime campaigns and the complexities of naval warfare more tangibly to the public and decision makers, alike in partnership of existing cultural forms. In short, it's easier to be educated about a tank plane or soldier as it's more readily accessible. It's difficult for the mass public to access the Navy, its history, and more importantly, high policy makers to visit and therefore understand the capabilities as part of national strategy and policy. King's itself had a role in this, particularly academic scholarship. Long before Sir Michael Howard founded the Department of War Studies 60 years ago, retired Royal Navy Captain Sir John Knox Lawton joined the history department at King's in the late 1800s, where the idea of professional academic naval history and the growth of naval history was further developed. The recording of the events of navies was far more than a dull account of far off battles, but applied history. It was not to provide an end goal, but a way of thinking. Lawton's work went on to inspire scholars in other nations, not least the United States, where US Admiral Stephen Luce and Captain Alfred Dea Mahan as historians founded the US Naval War College as part of the process of the development of the notion of American sea power and creating a quasi sea power state with the goal to maintain sea power as the correct choice in American defense and foreign policy. So what is going on here prior to 1945 is an intellectual academic push both within navies and outside. Scholarship is essential to this process. Many of the leading maritime strategic thinkers such as Corbett and naval strategists like Mahan are impacting and influencing thought through scholarship. They're advancing and enabling a forum for debate and discussion on naval topics, naval doctrine, but also maritime strategy, naval national strategy through applied history. And this is outwards facing rather than inwards facing. I mentioned earlier how it's harder for maritime and navies to outreach. So any turn inwards, create, creating an impenetrable barrier to decision makers and other services and so forth, actually backfires on those who are interested in a broader discussion about navies. In the past, naval and maritime scholars gained insight through the sustained application to recovering the useful past by sophisticated analysis, and this is communicated through their scholarship. Fundamental changes to the role of navies and thinking about maritime strategy in navies dramatically changed after 1945, and this is reflected in scholars' work, whether that be of naval history or contemporary questions of the future of navies and the shape and scope of sea power. The once relatively secure position of navies in national defense of continental states and island nations were challenged in the initial two post-war decades. Scholars since then have struggled to address this broader question and instead to revert it to addressing more specific and arguably more pressing topics. So maritime and maritime strategy disappears. And as I mentioned earlier, it becomes a question of naval power in a particular context, land-based views of navies driven by continental nations because the great island nation states were essentially broken post-war. This changes the discussion that scholars are engaged in because it's supported by mechanisms that focus on the potential of war in Europe, changes in organization like defense unification and the changing of national priorities and of course alliances like NATO and, and all these other things which are coming in. So we see a decline after 1945 uh, in, in maritime thinkers and scholarships related to it. It was kind of an atypical demonstration of questions being asked about causality kind of circling around the problem the ever-evolving nature of warfare that continued after the Second World War featured growth in a lexicon of verbiage, something naval scholars did little to help or readdress the growing distance of defence and government intellectuals from both navies and an understanding of sea power maritime strategy.
com complicating matters further, negative terms enter clinical language across culture and media, not just about navies, but in the British sense, economic, social, or political affairs of which naval historians didn't particularly appreciate was also being applied to navies. It emboldened post-war perceptions and arguments that navies and sea power were antiquated, imperial, and outdated. Simplistic and sentimental notions based on imperial naval power overpowered national sea power messages. Scholars ignored the question, did the state understand maritime strategy or navy's role in national policy? If not, why not? And what had changed? In short, it's plausible that using terms and concepts that featured regularly in scholarship, such as golden age for navies, generally attached to the age of sail or the great investment of fleets at the start of the 20th century, damaged not just perception of sea power and navies, but significantly damaged the next steps of developing maritime strategy and developing naval history of the field. If you were to use Corbett's 1911 work, Some Principles of Maritime Strategy, the hint is in the title. It's some principles, not the principles. So those engaged in serious historical research, naval maritime and strategic theory, who were focused on this were supposed to join and evolve this process, and it really didn't happen in naval scholarship. Excessive negativity, terms like fall and decline, became common in later 20th century naval history when writing and talking about navies. These deconstructive techniques and the labyrinth of technology also brought about negative change, creating an almost self-fulfilling prophecy because the message that was coming from scholars and historians was undermining the work of academics and scholars who are attempting to address the pressing question of the future of navies. A common path for scholarship was that so-called naval decline can only be understood when it's compared to an imperial notion of sea power. This rejected maritime strategy, asserting the role and function of the navy was therefore defunct of our empire. This wasn't helped by popular military and naval history, although it does increase in quality, but it rested on safe grounds like the Battle of Trafalgar. And academic history gets into a kind of tussle, as I mentioned earlier, the problems of making navies and naval history accessible to what is a land-dwelling readership. This underlines Clauschitz, Corbett, and others' criticism of the tendency to deploy a handful of catchphrases in heroic mythology because it offers very little to provide a basis of serious thought on current and future strategy, let alone a nuanced and sophisticated understanding of the past. And you can see arguments being offered by those who want to challenge and stop navies having an influence on defence policy in the 1950s, uh, really getting into quite large debates, particularly between historians about that. And you can pick up on things like the Battle of the Atlantic and the Battle of Britain. You can see this real tension coming between historians. It had very little to do with strategy and behind all of it, the, the military scholars who were involved with this were actually, they were trying to vie for political control and access to finance. So generally comparative studies of naval material asset numbers and technological aspects of naval warfare, carriers, nuclear propulsion, sensor systems or so on becomes the characteristic of naval focused scholarship throughout the latter 20th century. So the key point is one of fundamental change and that really shaped scholarship on navies and strategic thought who attempted to view the world from a maritime lens. So from this, there's some views, uh, some themes when viewing scholarship on navies naval history and warfare and maritime strategy post-1945. How scholars and thinkers responded to questions over the future of the Navy's role is particularly interesting because it was also a political snowball that was going on at the same time that looked at short-term tactical experience that overrode strategy. So it placed navies on the back foot from the outset, 1945, and it puts naval and maritime scholars on the back foot because navies were thinking and talking long-term focus rather than short-term results. This is the very reason you see a swelling of navalist scholarly output on both sides of the Atlantic with things like naval aviation, is they're trying to stay in step with short-term focus at the time of defense, fast results in aircraft from carriers and nuclear weapons and submarines off of that. So the pressing need to address immediate problems ejects and essentially cancels the development of serious naval history and serious Corbettian way of thinking about these problems. Other questions were more important at the time. What's the role of the Navy? What's emerging technologies? How are navies relevant to defense policy? So this veil of 1945 drops is almost a defense mechanism for naval focused scholars because of the pressing need to address threats to the future existence of navies uh, in continental nations, first and foremost, and this spills over into Britain. This is against the wishes of the few remaining in Corbettian thinkers and because of poor defense leadership in the 1950s that sought quick fix cost-effective solutions. Contemporary strategic naval-minded thought and scholarship is reduced to doctrinal glosses rather than deeper understanding of strategy and maritime influence upon it. So there's a certain irony here in the rush to evolve navies, and particularly island nations, it disregards strategic experience. Again, scholars are reflecting 
on this and in fact to some degree are, are pushing this this forward experience analyze over a period of time uh, which is more effective as an intellectual set of principles is effectively ejected uh, and also because they have, there are no great real uh, maritime strategic thinkers of the time there is no corbett a critical time during cold war panic nuclear weapons and so forth it's sort of the last stronghold of maritime influence uh, both on historians and defense policies such as the admiralty dragged into debates over technology, power and force rather than delivering strategic arguments. A situation that benefited the other scholars uh, and other services who were promoting a different ide ideology. So this rivalry and strategic bickering is reflected in scholarship, uh, which really didn't help drive forward a great understanding either within naval history or contemporary naval discussion. So, in a particular context of Britain, it's favoring continentalist doctrine and ways of viewing of the world. It's a land view, not a maritime view that really starts happening after 1945. And there was only any way to combat this was a strategic argument that historians had to put forward. And there wasn't sufficient response or capability within historians at the time uh, or maritime focused scholarship to push back. Now, there's a lot more to this than I get into today, but a key takeaway is, to sh is this shift by scholars from talking in maritime terms to talking and publishing in navies and sea power terms. And post-1960 scholars really struggle with this, and it's a particular low point in naval and maritime historiography. That thinking in maritime terms takes on a philosophical backwater is because uh, it's a question of national policy and trade and foreign policy. And naval thinkers are not in a mindset with the creation of unified defense or in a position to challenge the continental status quo that's coming from land and land-based air power theorists work. So scholars turn to talk about answering the technological changes in navies, the Soviet naval threat and building arguments along sea power lines. However, this makes navies and naval scholars work incredibly vulnerable to high level decision makers as shifting national priorities occur. Navies were, navies were viewed as essentially for answering just seaborne threats and scholarship did little to escape this inward looking approach. This has real world impact and is something Sir Julian Corbett demonstrated his lifetime scholarship through rigorous education. It does have real world impact scholarship because in the British context, continentalist doctrine runs prime after 1960s, and this is alien to British strategic experience. So Michael Howard provided a historical framework to support that argument, and the discussions on navies is reduced to one of capability and technology. Naval scholarship struggles to address this using applied history and spends more time refighting old battles, if not between naval historians. So the role of the naval historian as a broader strategy is lost time and to some degree, it's a lasting insult to the efforts of Corbett. And the real world impact, which I like to touch on, is demonstrate the Royal Navy is reduced to a niche role, subservient to the US Navy and confined to the North Atlantic. And the connection of an island with recognized sea dependency is cast aside, something that naval historians and scholarship was essential to promoting and communicating before. So this focus on technological questions reflected in a scholarship, it's antithetical to a maritime view of the world, with a question of what navies do in peace and wartime is lost in scholarly output because the focus is very much on naval capabilities to ensure navies survive and their value to the state is reinforced because of emphasis is placed on immediate problem. So in growing military, political, industrial bureaucracy where jointness is brutal as superior to strategy puts a stop to thinking and being responsive in maritime terms. So an entire way of scholarship, of maritime thinking and methodological prices, practices behind it are really ejected in the latter 20th century. And the, but there are few, very few who keep the lights on about this through research and scholarship. So to wrap up, as the Cold War continues, arguably to its height in the 1980s, it's a maritime campaign that enables or nudges maritime influences on policy and scholarship. And it gives rise to some scholarship about maritime influences. And this, of course, is the 1982 Falklands War. It starts advanced research into a host of maritime related questions like heritage, shipbuilding and so forth. It's not quite thinking in maritime strategic terms as it's still very technical and scholarship. You can still find the scholarship about this. How many ships, what weapon systems, how effective are they and how to address vulnerabilities? And actually, this is also reflected in history. You know, if you look at discussions, say, 1916 Battle of Jutland, these type of discussions are going on as well. But big ideas are starting to shape scholarship again of what navies can do in so-called peacetime and beyond just addressing threats at sea. And the word maritime starts to reappear in scholarship after hiatus after 1945. 
in the United States in the 1980s to see the idea of maritime strategy arrive decades after the US Navy failed to convince Congress for national maritime strategy. But it's really an area that we start to see confusion over terms like naval strategy, naval doctrine, maritime strategy take off. And this is generally because a continental nation using the term maritime strategy in its color scholarship. American navalists are pushing this, but in reality, it's not national policy, it's naval strategy, and either army or air force are supporting it. That this conversation is evolving in literature, coming up to the end of Cold War is no fluke, and naval capabilities expand, including trade, trade and global logistics coming to the limelight, the last few years notwithstanding. But it's an exceptionally slow process well into the 21st century. Only recently have we seen books exploring the impact of navies and maritime warfare on the success of periods like the Second World War and being positive about them. I know I'd certainly argue that I think until recently, uh, the impact of, of, of navies and their involvement in places like the Second World War were actually quite negative. And, and as um, Professor uh, mentioned earlier, actually, we've only really started exploring that now with some great output. But it really demonstrates the slow pace at which serious research and scholarship again on maritime strategy and maritime aspects of warfare published to be outward looking. And we can look at debates on the relationship between maritime thinking and space to see that actually today. So utilizing that proven methodology of analyzing trends and applying that to the historiography of navies and naval warfare after 1945, that this puzzle to understand the development of naval maritime strategy and the field of naval history comes to light and potentially may have come full circle. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, I will move uh, quickly on to our third speaker, uh, Dr. Christina Goulter. He's uh, uh, co-director of the Sir Michael Howes Centre for the History of War at King's and also a uh, co-theme lead for the military and political history uh, research theme. Uh, she's going to talk to us today about uh, historiography of air power since the, second, since the First World War. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Bill, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it, it's like a comet coming into view with clockwork precision. It seems that every seven years I'm asked to contribute to one or other official history. And my most recent studies are paired with RAND in 2015 and OUP in 2016. And these works examined the 2011 Libyan air campaign. The work was commissioned by the US Air Force in collaboration with the REF, and I was brought on board for a number of reasons. I used to work for the Americans at the US Naval War College. And since that time, I've had an advisory role at the USAF Research Institute. Um, being invited to do such work is on one level really gratifying because you're identified as somebody who's a trusted partner and can make sound judgments on subjects, but it also carries enormous burdens of responsibility. If you don't make the right judgments, it could well be that military practitioners in the future uh, make the wrong decisions and people end up paying the ultimate price. And I try never to lose sight of this, this burden of responsibility. I want to start by making some very general reflections about the nature of official history before discussing the official histories of the First World War and Second World War. And then I'm going to bring it right up to date uh, and talk about how official history writing today differs from previous generations. My bottom line is that the writing of official history has generally improved. Today, it is far more about explanatory history rather than purely narrative history. And then before I close, I want to just briefly touch on some of the perils of researching what can be very brutal subjects. In this case, I've been researching back-to-back -back civil war scenarios, and I think these um, various studies have undoubtedly left a mark on me, so I want to have a quick reflection on that. I think it's the case that all good historians go through a rite of passage, the point at which they realize that official histories aren't necessarily always gospel. And I think it comes as a considerable shock when people realize that they don't necessarily agree with everything that is written in official histories uh, and that they are not necessarily the definitive word on particular subjects. And what was striking about the official histories of the First World War and Second World War experiences is that how different they are in terms of their rigor. At one end of the scale, we have what remains the single best analysis of strategic bombing 
in World War II by Charles Webster and Noble Franklin. And that was published at the beginning of the 1960s. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have the history of the air war between 1914 and 18 by Raleigh and Jones, written during the 1920s and reflecting very much the dogma of the day by, by elevating the role and achievements of strategic bombing. All history, official or otherwise, should be judged by the same basic criteria. We need to keep in mind a number of questions. We must ask, who is the author? And, and this is where E.H. Carr is, is right, that you should always study the historian before studying the facts presented. Uh, and I, I think he was largely right when he said that. We should go on to ask, what are the basic assumptions that lie at the basis of selection and organization of facts? When was a particular history written? There is a danger, I think, of forgetting these very basic questions when we read official history, because unconsciously we see official history as serious work having been sponsored by official organizations. And therefore we presume that the history written must be rigorous. But these questions are even more important um, when we're dealing with a military sphere, because drawing the wrong conclusions ultimately ends up in lives being lost unnecessarily and certainly wasted treasure. So having said that we must judge all history by the same basic criteria, what then is the precise function of official histories? Is it not sufficient to rely merely on the collective scholarship of individuals working in a particular field. I think British air power in particular has been well served by historians over the last couple of decades in particular, but even if we take these works collectively, they don't result in a comprehensive treatment of the air campaign since the First World War. The prime role, I think, of official history is to ensure comprehensive coverage of all operations and campaigns. Uh, and this is important for the lessons learned process. I think it's also very important so that we honor properly those people who participated in those conflicts. The difficulty with official history is that sponsoring departments often are very uncomfortable with anything less than glowing assessments of various campaigns or conflicts. And I think this is what really differentiates the First World War official history from the Second World War history. World War I history by Raleigh and Jones is partisan and largely narrative in the count. Whilst Jones was at least a historian by training, Raleigh was chosen for his literary skill. And this is the way this history comes across. It's a carefully crafted piece of literature, but without pause for a reflection. And I think this had very serious consequences because planning and procurement, which went on uh, in the 1930s, was heavily influenced by the Raleigh and Jones official history simply because it was the most accessible digest available at the time. Um, but the seven volume history was also written against the backdrop of very severe budget cuts in the 1920s when the RAF's very survival was at stake and having to compete with the traditional services, the RAF had to come up with a role that lay beyond uh, a support to the traditional services uh, and faced dismemberment. Um, therefore, Raleigh and Jones were put under a lot of pressure to highlight that part of the official history which offered something different. In that case, it was strategic bombing, particularly in 1917. 18. And seemingly the verdict that they offered that strategic bombing really made a decisive difference was apparently further reinforced by the British Empire policing experience um, when the RAF was called upon to quell various uprisings in the empire. Now, in contrast, the official history of the British bomber offensive in World War II by Webster and Franklin analyzed the good, the bad, and the very ugly of that campaign, even in the face of very serious pressure from the Air Ministry to tone down some of the criticism of Bomber Command. Franklin, who was the principal author, did not fall into the trap 
of making exaggerated claims for the efficacy of the bomber offensive. The failures in the first two years of the war uh, are explained in detail as a consequence of a complex set of factors, had material expansion of the RAF in the 1920s and 30s was not matched by a training organization, how the doctrine of the day downplayed the challenges posed by long range navigation, bad weather, and a potent enemy air defense system. And the many controversies which arose during the Second World War were also analyzed in detail, especially things like Sir Arthur Harris's insistence on pursuing a, a strategy of area bombing when the Ministry of Economic Warfare and other service chiefs argued very convincingly that attacks needed to occur against German transport or oil production. According to Franklin, the Air Ministry took what he said was very strong objection to massive and key parts of the official history. And Webster and Franklin then had to appeal to the Secretary of the Cabinet Office, Sir Norman, Sir Norman Brooke, to intervene. And the latter's judgment was that the Air Ministry had been totally unreasonable. The official historian's verdict on the bomber offensive remained intact and we are the beneficiaries of a very objective and comprehensive analysis as a result. And I think since the 1960s, air power scholars have tried to emulate what Webster and Franklin uh, attempted to do, I think very successfully. I don't think their work has been seriously challenged over the last 50 years. And I think only a handful of scholars have matched or surpassed their standard of scholarship, especially as far as strategic bombing is concerned. Unfortunately, however, the other roles performed by the Royal Air Force in World War II have not received the same standard of treatment. Um, another set of official historians in the Rally and Jones Mall, Dennis Richards and Hilary Saunders, were asked to write an official history of the whole of the RAF's operations in World War II. Uh, while Webster and Franklin sought to explain the RAF's deficiencies and why it conducted the bomber offensive in the way it did, Richards and Saunders tend to describe the various campaigns with a selection of antiquarian facts in support. Anyone wanting to understand what the RAF did in wider in Europe, North Africa, Middle East, Far East or Atlantic is far better served by looking at the 30 plus volumes of the cabinet office histories, which at least set air operations within the wider strategic context. For example, Stephen Roskell's cabinet office official history, The War at Sea, remains one of the best, and I think very even handed treatments of what the RAF achieved in the Battle of the Atlantic. Should anyone attempt to write a proper official history of the RAF in World War II and replace the Richards and Saunders volumes, they will have an uphill task. Whilst the various official historians uh, had free access to air ministry, command and other official documentation, much of this material has been lost since the 1970s when the largest tranche of uh, World War II documents came up or review. Um, and the material that was used by the official historians was supposed to be preserved for posterity. But the much of the documentation relating to policy, planning and operations was weeded out by reviewers who collectively lacked a historical nose. They were typically accountants or um, scientists by background. And, and this has been made all the more serious by the fact that Raleigh and Jones uh, failed to reference their sources. However, all is not lost because at least the Air Ministry's Air Historical Branch, which still exists within RAF, wrote its in-house narrative histories of all campaigns since 1939. And at least these allude to the old documentation which has subsequently been lost. But having said this, that RAF, and all those who served and died in World War II and various campaigns since deserve far more than purely narrative history. If military historians 
are to protect their profession from the criticism leveled at them that they are merely dealers in antiquarianism, they must engage in explanatory history rather than descriptive history. As E.H. Carr reminds us, the study of history is a study of causes, how the historian deals in the multiplicity of causes and how every historical argument revolves around the question of priority of causes. Before I close, I just want to have a few quick um, personal reflections on the nature of official history writing. I've been involved in a number of officially sponsored research projects, most recent being the study of the Libyan air campaign of 2011. In November of 2011, I was uh, contacted by one of my former students who was then working in the Pentagon. And uh, he said that the US Air Force wanted what was described as a trusted entity to do a study of the British contribution to Operation Unified Protector, the campaign against Gaddafi's regime. And I said, sure thing, when do you need the first draft of this history? And when I was told April of next year, April of 2012, I gasped. And, and why I did that was because I had to go through various processes in order to be given access to the classified documents. And then I had scarcely a month to write this thing. And it then had to go through various hoops of approval before the unclassified version appeared with Rand in 2015. And writing under pressure is never a good thing, but I managed to produce the first draft by the beginning of April and happily those who presided over the official project um, changed very little. So I had this sort of warm glow of satisfaction of having produced something that was of worth, not just to my own satisfaction, but something hopefully which would help to inform current air operations. And that sort of warm glow lasted for some time. But what I didn't anticipate, however, was the impact that this study would have on me as a human being. What this work demanded was an insight into what Gaddafi had been doing to his own people. And when the protests broke out against Gaddafi's regime in February of 2011, Gaddafi singled out certain centers of opposition for special treatment. He spoke about dealing with the vermin of Benghazi and how the population needed to be taught a lesson. His son, Khamis, who was in charge of 32 Brigade, developed a particularly bad reputation for brutality. And I will not get it any more graphic than this, but suffice it to say that when Gaddafi met his end at the hands of the Mizratans, it was payback. And several months after completing this work, I realized that the subject matter had more of an impact on me than I appreciated at the time. I think the most obvious manifestation of this was having difficulty getting back into what was then my main research on the Greek Civil War with all its attendant brutality. I managed to complete an article in 2014 on the subject, but then I had to take a complete break and write on something very, very different. And the completely different took the form of a study of the cargo war between India and Pakistan in 99, mainly from an intelligence point of view. And this piece of work uh, appeared in the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. And what I'm contemplating doing now is writing uh, an article on the historian's craft and what the examination of brutality does to the researcher. If Noble Franklin was still alive, I would ask him, as a former navigator in Bomber Command in World War II, how did the writing of this official history affect him? In today's parlance, did it revive PTSD issues? The trouble with such questions is that you have difficulty asking them unless you are seen to be a uniformed person of, of uh, some experience. And I've come across several military people who believe that only the soldier scholar can write proper military history. But from our perspective, um, there's also the awkward question as to whether former military are too close to their subjects to offer truly objective verdicts. And to his great credit, I think Noble Franklin did, and this is why his work has remained an exemplar. And if I have a final worry about the profession, that's the extent to which the digital age is a help or hindrance for future historians. On one level, it's a concern over how long digital records remain intact, 
But the other observation is um, that you have a lot of military who no longer engage in things like writing personal diaries. But what I've also noticed in their post-operational reports, a lot of that is getting shorter and shorter and far less critical of their own military apparatus or the wider governmental apparatus. So I think to, to close, here's the danger. If historians of the future are dependent on a partial digital record, I think the profession may be threatened by populist narratives. And this is something that is written about very profoundly um, by Anne Applebaum in her excellent book, Twilight of Democracy. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely. Thank you to our uh, three speakers. Uh, I hope are going to appear in panel format now on the screen. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so slightly less for questions, so I won't uh, hog the screen, but we have one question uh, already from Carl Islam. We, other questions can be put in the Q&A uh, function on Zoom, please. But Carl is asking us, in modern warfare involving nuclear power, does Machiavelli's argument still hold that it's not wealth, that it is the Arsenius war, but good soldiers, uh, or sailors or airmen, in fact. <laughs> well, can, can, I, can I start? Yes, please, Gary. It's both. I mean, obviously, as I, I was saying at the, the, end, the end of my, my piece, that all of this stuff needs to be integrated. But of course, unless you've got the raw material which is prepared to fight, which is prepared to train, which is prepared to cooperate, then actually you're not going to, going to produce uh, uh, you're not be effective in combat. So, so much of it is about getting, getting the, the personnel and, and, and training right. And it's fascinating listening to my, my colleagues, uh, to, to the, uh, thinking about how much of about my arguments about armies are also applicable to air forces and navies. I would have thought in spades, and also it tends to be more technological as well. Thank you. Christina and Dave, do you have an observation? I, I think one of the sort of obvious areas is the importance of education and comprehensive education. Um, and whenever there have been budget cuts, it, it tends to be things like military education that comes under the closest scrutiny and is an easy target for, for, for cutting. Um, so there's no substitute for intellect and thoughtfulness. It's no coincidence that the finest soldiers, sailors and airmen done throughout military history have been either scholars in their own right, but they tend to read voraciously. Um, and that, I think, you know, whenever I come across military students of that ilk, I'm always encouraged. So it, it, it's, it, it's about sort of main, maintaining that as, as the sort of core capability to think through some of the challenges that we're facing currently, which require very nuanced approaches. Um, but I, I would argue um, also some serious thinking and reflection on, on what we saw in the late 1930s. Thanks. Can you proceed up, James? I think if I can, I can build on the education argument, I, I think naval historians are in a, in a bit of a interesting position here because the, the roots of the field somewhat is in professional military education, naval historian, the field starting out, first thing is about educating naval officers and something that I think has actually been achieved probably in the past 30 or 40 years because naval historian and naval history has been so tied to talking about contemporary issues and they sort of had this theme going through, let's talk about the modern Navy, even a bit of navalism in it, that actually has been a separation a little bit that um, the we've seen naval history increase in quality either the public, public or academic because there's been some real quality research to try and understand the past and it not be so dominated by purely answering uh, contemporary strategic studies questions what it is on the other hand uh keeping this thread off uh, and picking up exactly what and supporting what christina said um naval officers uh, academics being involved in study of history reading um, really, I think, from the naval perspective, disappears post-1945. So we're seeing that uh, technological aspect come in. Technology can solve everything. Really, the people who, in, from naval circles, are talking more in strategic terms, and foreign policy terms, and, and talking about these questions of the future, well, who are they? 
they are the people who have attended the war co courses and the and uh, studied history uh, when they went to places like Greenwich back in, in the 1910s and so forth. And then the ones who are speaking out in the 1940s and 1950s, that disappears. We end up really talking about technological solutions. So we've seen this change, I think, in the latter 20th century, and perhaps we're going through one again, where actually there is this pull of purely talking technological terms, but actually there is more to talk about than that. And historians have a role in kind of trying to balance this out a little bit, would be my kind of view. Thank you, James. Uh, was that addressing uh, the other question on the focus of contemporary technology and conflict, which has just popped up, or is that a different question? Can you see that in the Q&A? Uh, oh, yeah, I got, got that, yes. Yeah. Do you want me to have a go? Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of minutes left. Yes. Uh, OK, it's, it's about whether, I guess, it's about... The, history of warfare, how relevant is it in an age in which increased digitalization of warfare has led to a cent more of a focus of contemporary technology in conflict? Um, I've been hanging around the fringes of the British Armed Forces since 1985. Uh, first of all, Sandhurst and then the Staff College and moving beyond that, but still having stuff to, 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 to do. It's a perennial battle, but uh, history is bunk, but actually the only thing that matters is recent stuff. Actually, I'm... I mean, both Christine and James have already addressed this, but actually understanding history in depth and context is absolutely critical, not least because many of the things which pop up as being new actually tend to have roots deep in the past. And I'd agree with Christina, it's actually the most impressive military people I've come across who read an awful lot, who read military history, and they're prepared to read if like outside the box. So the classic thing is you know, going back to and the Peloponnesian Wars and recognizing that there are uh, uh, lessons, inverted commas, to be drawn from ancient conflicts. That is warfare, things don't repeat themselves um, exactly, but there's lots of, well, as, as Andrew Gordon uh, would say, approximate precedents. And so a, a good grounding in history, I think, is the difference between very often uh, a mediocre officer and someone who actually understands the tools of, of their trade. Gary, uh, we have another question for James Smith, but I'm aware we have essentially one minute left. So perhaps James might type an answer to that question before we uh, the session ends. But I'd like to end by thanking our three speakers. Uh, very interesting insights into the past. I uh, didn't say much about the future. My question would have been, well, what's next? Uh, a couple of you mentioned applied history. Possibly that is something that is going to uh, influence historiography as we go forwards. But that's a thought. Uh, to leave you with, to thank our panellists uh, for their contributions today uh, and uh, uh, hope our uh, audience uh, enjoyed the session and will engage with the other sessions uh, of the conference going forward over the next couple.